And uh, today I'm going to be sharing a message that's uh, close to my heart. And I say that because it represents a journey that I myself had to go on with God. And, um, and this message is just going to take us back to the basics of our relationship with God, to the fatherhood of God. And you know, it's always a great moment when people come to Christ, uh, when people embrace their salvation, or if uh, we use our Christian lingo, we say when people get saved. And uh, you know, we, we, the, the Bible says there's much rejoicing in heaven when even one person turns to God, one person repents. And it's a great day, but that is not it. In fact, your salvation or the moment you come to Christ is actually just the beginning of your journey with this amazing God. It's just the starting point. Your salvation is the door that you enter in. It is only the door. And beyond that door, there is a whole journey. There is an adventure. There is so much that God has for each and every one of us. So much He wants to reveal to us. So much He wants to, to show us and and. It is Him. It's not what we get out of Him. It's not what we, what we can receive. It is Him. The, and, and He introduced Himself to Abraham. As, and, he, and He says it like this, Abraham, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Not what I can give you. Not the treasures that I can bless you with. He says, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And there is so much that God has for you, there's so much more that God has for you to discover and encounter. That's why people, people write hymns like this when they, when they understand this. They write this hymn. Uh, I remember hearing this hymn a lo long time ago. He said, you are beautiful beyond description. Too marvelous for words. Too wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard. And you go, who can know your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your... How many of you know that song? Yeah. You are beautiful Be I'm, I'm going to try to do the dainate here. You are beautiful beyond description. Too marvelous for words. Too wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can know your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty and throne above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. In awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. Amen such a good God. And uh, the reason why I'm saying that is because there's so much of God. That He's beautiful beyond description. He's too marvelous for words. He's too wonderful for our comprehension. And, and there's so much more that He wants to show you, that He wants to lead you. Do not be satisfied by just standing at the door. Oh, I'm saved. You know, let me just pitch a tent here and stay here by the door. You know, no one does that. No one comes to your house and says, oh, I'm in. Let me just hang out at the door because as long as I'm in your house, you want to explore. You want to see what's cooking in the kitchen. You want to see if the aircons are on. You want to enjoy all. And God's got so much more for each and every one of us. And it's a sad day when we turn this, 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 this faith with a living God into religion into a set of uh, religious observations, a set of do's and don'ts. And I mean, this is a relationship with a loving, living, feeling, hearing, reaching out God. He's alive, He's real, and you matter to Him. Your life matters to Him. In fact, it matters so much that He left His place in heaven and He came down on earth, lived among men, 
received ridicule, got, got abused, and you know, took our sins, everything that would hinder us from having that relationship. He dealt with it. He took, uh, took it upon himself and went to that cross and dried, died, didn't dry, but he died a cruel death on that cross. For what? So that you and I can, can be restored to this relationship with the Father. So that you and I can go on this great journey with God. So that everything that, is, that would hinder you from coming to God, from having this relationship with God, would be removed. So that nothing can keep you away from Him and nothing can keep His love from you. That's a great God. Amen? And, and it's a sad day when we forsake relationship and turn, turn this into traditions and, you know, it's about just a religious observation. I just, I'm in church on Sunday. That's my Christianity. That's what it's all about. And, and, and this was a problem with God. And you see God addressing this issue throughout biblical history in the time of Isaiah. He sends Isaiah to speak to his people and, and the issue he was, he was dealing with was this. He says, For as much as people draw near to me with their mouths, and they honor me with their lips, but remove their hearts and minds far from me, and their fear and reverence for me are a commandment of men that is learned by reputation, without any thought as to the meaning. So what he's saying is people knew God. They went through the motions. They did all they were supposed to do. Uh, you know, they, they, they went to church on Sundays, they observed the laws, they did all these things, but their hearts were far from me. And, and this, this problem didn't change. And we see Jesus having to deal with the same issue when he was around. He quotes the same scripture in Matthew 15, uh, verse 7, as he's speaking to the Pharisees, to the religious people of that day. He says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote those people, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. He says they're doing all these things, but their hearts are far from me. You see, God is after our hearts. God wants a relationship. He doesn't want religion. He wants a relationship. He's a living God and we are His children. He wants a relationship with us. He's after our hearts. And, and we need to grow in that. And, and one way we grow is by having a right perspective or a right view of who God is. The right picture of God. It's one of the most important things that we need to have. Because having a wrong picture of God will affect you in so many ways. It will affect the decisions that you make. It will affect how you relate to people. It will affect how you, you handle uh, crises and circumstances that come your way. It will affect the decisions that you make for your future. Because many people worship God but don't know Him. And to understand and to benefit from any relationship you need to know the one that you're having the relationship with. You need to understand that, that one's heart. Yeah. You know, because we could, we could come to church every week, we could know about God, we could know the Bible inside out, but yet not know the heart of God. And that's what Jesus was addressing when He, when he spoke to the Pharisees. Because they, they had the right, the right dress. They dressed right. They knew the scriptures inside out. They walked right. They, they, they were in the synagogue every week. They did all their prayers religiously. And, but yet, Jesus says, they don't know me. Their hearts are far from me. And um, there are lots of, like if, you know, I've got lots of friends on Facebook. Probably about a thousand over people who are associate, uh, people who I'm associated with in some way, met at some point, church people and, and different people from other churches and stuff. You know, if you ask any of those people, do you know Clarence? They'll say, yeah, I know Clarence. But the question is, do they really know me? They would know of me. They would know the, the, the little bit about me based on some Facebook post that I put up. And most of us know that most of us don't. Most of us know that Facebook posts actually don't give you any truth about the person behind the post. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay, let's not go there. Anyway, but only people in my 
world who have a personal relationship with me, only they can tell you, I know Clarence, and they could tell you stuff about me which you can say, yeah, that's true. That's true. Because, and how you know God, having this personal relationship with God, is really, really important. We all know the story about, uh, in the Bible, about in Matthew 25, and, and it's the parable of the talents, where, where Jesus tells his story, and he, he, he gives this, this, three, this master comes, and he gives his three servants. How many of you know the story? You can see your hands. Okay, I think most of you know the story. He gives this, the, his three servants different amounts of talents. And talents basically is like money or some form of currency in those days. And one servant gets five talents, one servant gets two talents, and the other one gets one talent. And, and the master goes away. He doesn't give them any instruction. He just goes away. And, uh, and the servants... Two servants go out and, you know, they do all these, these things that they're supposed to do and, 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 and stuff like that. And then the master comes back and, and the master, his servants gather before him, these three servants. And the first servant says, Master, the five talents you gave me, I invested it. I went and did this. I bought shares. I, you know, I went and, you know, did this and that. And, you know, here it is. I've doubled it. Here's 10 talents, I'm giving it back to you. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. And then the other servant comes and says, master, you know, the two, the two talents that you gave me, you know, I, I bought a Goreng Pisang stall, you know, I started a chain of Goreng Pisang stalls now, and you know, I've multiplied, I've multiplied it, and now, now here's four talents, it's doubled. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. And then the servant with the one talent, he comes and he says, he says this, he says, uh, Lord, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid the talent in the ground. Look, there you have it. What is yours? The one talent that you gave me. And the Master's response is this, you wicked and lazy servant. He calls him not just lazy, wicked and lazy servant. And, and most of us will read this story and we think, you know, this is about, you know, how God wants us to multiply our talents, multiply, it's about investing. And, you know, and the servant with the one talent was a bad investor. No, the servant with the one talent was not a bad investor. That is only a portion of the story. The problem with the, the, the thing that the story is revealing is, the, the problem with this, this guy with the one talent is, was not that he was a bad investor, was the fact that he had a bad or a wrong perception of the master, which affected what he decided to do with his talent and ultimate, ultimately affected his destiny. Because you see, he starts off like this, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. He thought he knew his master. And he says, and this is, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid. And because of his wrong perception or his wrong knowledge, it influenced what he did. Therefore, I went and hid the talent in the ground. So it's not so much a parable about bad investment, it's a parable about not knowing the master's heart. Three servants all served the same master, probably grew up in the same house to get it right. They go out and invest, and the master says, well done, good and faithful. So they know the master's heart. They know the response. One guy exposed to the same master, but yet he, had, he thought he knew the master, but he did not know the master at all. And he, doesn't, and he does the wrong thing. And when you have a wrong perception of God, the enemy can come and, and distort your whole understanding or or just distort your view of how you should do life and how you should relate to God. And we still see that in churches today. We still see that. It is not just an old parable. Today, you'll have Christians who will come and tell you, you know, God, God is punishing me because, you know, I, I, I didn't go to church. Oh, I've got this cancer. I remember praying for someone who said, you know, you know Pastor, God gave me this cancer. And if God wants to heal me, He will take it away. They thought they knew God. And, and, and they ascribe to God the very works of the devil. Listen, God doesn't have cancer to give anyone. 
There are Christians who will say, you know, God is judging the nation. That is why He sent that earthquake to Mount Kinabalu. To warn the churches, to warn the nation, God is angry. So God is judging the nation, so He killed some Singaporean children on Mount Kinabalu. That's not the God we serve. So you can think you have an understanding, but get it all wrong. Like that sermon, I knew you were like this. That's why I did this. And a lot of Christians know God is like that. That's why they, they are living with sickness, living with disease. That's why they're giving a bad rap, rap to God because of their wrong understanding of who the master is. Amen? Yes. So we can ascribe to God the very works of the devil and say that's God. It's God's will. And that will keep us from living, and, uh, living a victorious life. And that's why the master calls that servant wicked. You're wicked. Because you are painting a picture of a wicked God to people. Which is wrong. You know, for years of my life, I knew God. I went to church. I did all the, the right religious things needed to do. I was a faithful servant. I knew of Him. I knew about Him. I knew the God of my parents. I knew the God of my Sunday school teacher. But He was, he was never my God. I knew the God the churches spoke about. But He was never my God. I never knew Him personally. So if you asked me many years ago to, to describe what this God the Father looks like, I would have probably pictured someone sitting on this huge ivory throne high up in the heavens with a very long beard, longer than the one that Shashi has right now. <laughs> and you know, aloof and angry and you know, not interested in my life much, so I have to kind of do a lot of stuff to get his attention or I, I didn't stay out of his bad books. So I would have had that kind of a picture of God. And I always thought that people who wanted to, to become close to God had to really like, you know, give up everything tasty about life. You must eat food without salt. <laughs> you, know, that's the, you know, you just have to kind of give up everything that is and, uh, tasty. We're going to live in a monastery somewhere, climb on a hill somewhere, just, you know, disassociate yourself from the world. And it did help that the people from the church that I was from, and the ones who were really close to God, who were really holy, they all wore white saris. And they... <laughs> and, and they sat in church for hours and, and they were just praying. And, and you had to have that hand shiver when you pray. Because that meant you were really holy. And, and you know, I wanted none of that action. I said, no, no, I'm not ready for all of that. And plus I look terrible in a white sari. <laughs> so I said, okay, never mind God. One day, one day when I'm, you know, when I'm done with life, when I'm done with everything that is, you know, good about life and, you know, and I'm ready, I'm all one foot in the grave, then I will start to draw close to God. I didn't want to have anything to do with Him. And, but that was never God's intention for us, for mankind. And if you read the Bible, you know that God from day one, when He created Adam and Eve, He wasn't starting... A, a, a bunch of, he wasn't creating a bunch of servants. He wasn't creating an army. He was creating a son and a daughter for him to love and to relate to. That was God's intention when he was creating people. But people didn't want that relationship with God. They were afraid. They wanted, they wanted uh, I, I spoke about last week how they told Moses, listen, just, just you go to God and you give us the rules and the regulations, what we must do. We did, they didn't want to get close to this God. They just said, tell us what to do and we will do it. And that's how religion was born. Everyone just living by rules and regulations and at the expense of relationship. And the religious people always painted a picture of a, of a God that's angry, that's, you know, always looking at you and telling you how unworthy you are. God was always not pleased with them. And you'll be surprised that even today, there are a lot of people who think that our God is a judgmental God. There's some of you sitting here may, may be feeling that way about God. He's a performance-based God. If I do well, he will, be, he will love me. He'll be pleased with me. If I don't do well, He hates me, angry, and He's always angry with me. He's going to punish me. He's judgmental. He's waiting for me to mess up. The people who think that God is uncaring, He doesn't care so much what, what's going on in my life, critical, or He's too distant. You know, He's really far from me. 
And if you're sitting here and if that's your view of God, I want to assure you that that view is wrong. And today God wants to change that view, that wrong view that you've been having of God. Today God wants to reintroduce Himself to you again for a fresh start for your life, for a fresh journey with Him. Amen? And that was part of Jesus' mission. That was what He came to correct. He came to give, give people a correct perception of God, of the Father. Accurately represent Him because up to that point, the religious people misrepresented God terribly. They painted a picture of a God that was angry, He was so far away that the only way you could gain His pleasure or gain some kind of a blessing was to live your life so perfectly and to become like them, so religious and holy. Only then you'd be able to draw near to this God. And, and it made people feel hopeless and, you know, that's impossible. How on earth am I going to be ever going to be able to draw near, draw near to, this, to this holy God? And I believe God had enough of that. God had enough of His representatives on earth giving Him a bad reputation. So He decided, you know what, I'm going to go down myself and introduce, reintroduce myself to these people. Reintroduce my heart. Let them see my heart again so that they will know my true, my true nature. And, and, he came into, and Jesus came into the scene and He started describing a God that loved mankind, that loved people. A God that reached out to people that society rejected, the lepers, the, the prostitutes, all this, the God that wanted to reach out to these people. A God that was interested in, in your life as a father is interested in the life of a child. A God that loves unconditionally and forgives. And you know, and when he wanted to describe this God, he told him the story of the prodigal son. Uh, most of you know this story, so I'm just going to paraphrase out of it, Pastor Jai did a great job preaching out of this scripture some weeks ago. And the prodigal son is basically about a father who's got two sons. And the younger son come, comes to the dad and he says, Dad, give me my inheritance now. All that I'm supposed to receive after you die, I want it now. So that was an insult in their culture to the, to the people of that time. That's like he was basically disowning his parents. His father is saying, I, I couldn't be bothered if you die or you're living. I want what is mine now. So the father doesn't say anything. Father gives him what is his. And he goes out, he travels, and he goes to distant lands, and, uh, and he indulges in loose living. You know, he, he, he has women, he has friends, you know, good time friends. You know, when you have lots of money, a lot of good time friends come around you, party, drinks. And, you know, and, and just has this, this, this so-called great time that he was looking for. And all of a sudden, a famine hits the land. And, and now, he's, he's finished all his money. He's got nothing left. All that was his, his inheritance is gone. And, and he's, he's seated there and he's thinking, you know, what am I going to do? All my good time friends are gone as well. With the money, as the money came, they came. As the money left, they left. And now here I'm stuck with nothing. And, and he goes and tries to look for jobs, for a job. And he gets a job in a pigsty. Kandang Babi. <laughs> and, and he goes and works in the pigsty. And, and he, he not, only, not only that, he's, he needs to, because there's, it's a famine, he shares the food with the pig. He was eating with pigs. You know, a lot of us eat with pigs, but this is different. This is like real, <laughs> real pigs. And, and in, that, in that moment, in that, in that point when he was, Hanging out with his pigs, you know. <laughs> he, he had this moment of clarity where he all of a sudden realized, hey, what am I doing here? In my father's house, even the servants, even the servants get better treatment than the treatment I'm getting here. I think I'm just going to, you know what? Swallow my pr pride and just get up, go back to my father's house, ask him to forgive me, ask him to receive me again. You know, not, I'm not worthy to be his son. Just make me his servant. Even a servant in his house is better than this. And he starts to make this journey back, back to his father. And, and, and the story is getting really interesting because 
the, to the Jewish people, this guy is beyond salvation. This guy has just crossed too many lines. And, and Jesus comes to this point where he says in Luke 15 verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, kissed him, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring out the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry, for this is my son. He was once dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And they began to make merry. You see, this was shocking to those people. At that. For us, it's just a nice story. You know, oh, that's sweet, that's really nice of the dead. But Jesus was, was, was shooting down some, some religious beliefs and mindsets. He was breaking some ground here with this story. Because to the, to the Jewish culture, this, this story was starting to sound like a horror movie. The ending. Because this guy... You know, firstly, he dishonored his father. That itself is like a massive sin in their culture. It's wrong. You know, this kind of son should be beaten up. You know, he dishonored his dad. He wanted his inheritance now. He indulged in loose living. He's gone to prostitute. He went and hung out with the Gentiles. That again was like terrible. How can you go and hang out with these people, prostitutes, drinks, you know, women and stuff like that. Gone, his cross. That itself he broke like, you know, about... Ten laws already. On top of that, to make matters worse, the ultimate, he went and worked in a big sty. I mean, that is like crossing the point of no return. Pigs, you know, pigs, to help you understand, pigs to the Jewish people is the same as Babi to the Malay people, <laughs> to the Muslims. So, in their culture, so, if, if a Muslim boy goes and works in a, works in a pigsty and eat, eats the food that the pigs eat, what do you think his imams or his, or his family would, would tell him? He, haram. So, yeah, so the, you know, and, they, and they got it, this whole idea was, they got it from the, from the, from the Torah, from the, from the scriptures, from the Jewish people. So, the Jewish people are the original people who started with this whole pigs thing and uh, who, who God did give them some laws at that point and it was for a very good reason. We won't go into that now. But this guy had gone and Jesus specifically said a pig style. He ate with pigs because he knew pigs to them was an untouchable, unthinkable thing. The moment you touch a pig or you associate with, with it, you become ceremonially unclean and you know, you cannot go worship God. And, and Jesus said, a pig sty. And not to make it, to rub it in a, a little bit more, he says he ate the, 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 the food that the pigs ate as well. So to them, you know, if, if, if the religion of the represented God of that, of that time had a chance to write the ending of the story, it would have been very different. But Jesus writes a whole different ending. They would have been expecting this guy goes back, father catches him, throws manana on him and burns him, <laughs> whips him from far. But it says here, when he was still a far way off, his father saw him runs to his son, runs to his son, hugged and kissed him. You can imagine all the people listening. Like, <laughs> what? It was a famine in the land. He didn't have time to, to go and bathe, wash himself, comb, side putting, all and come. There's no water. He came as he was, filthy, smelling like a pig. And his father runs and hugs him, kisses him. And this guy is trying to explain, you know, Dad, you know, uh, please, the father won't have any, doesn't even want to hear. He says, bring out the best robe, 
put it on him, put a ring in his, in his hand and, a, and sandals on his feet. That's, that, that's talking about restoring him back to the family, the ring, the family signet. He belongs to his family. Put it back on his hand. Give a robe, that ro- robe of royalty. Cover all his shame and his dirt. Bring the fatted calf. That just represents the fatted calf. And let us kill it and let us eat and be merry for my son who has once lost his father. Let's celebrate the son's return. I mean, most of us, if we were in that father's position, ah, came back, ah. <laughs> ah? We took a one day, ah. Mm. Well, underestimate my Tamil, ah. Came back, lah, ah? Huh? Mm. What I told you? Mm. Ah, you know how you made your mother cry? Ah, you go and say sorry. Ayo. Anyway, the focus of the story that Jesus was telling, you know, we call it the prodigal son. It's actually a prodigal father. A rich, wasteful father. Wasteful with his love on his people. And, um, and Jesus was saying that this father, Jesus was telling these people of that time who up to that point had a wrong perspective of, the fa- of God. He's saying, this is your God. This is what he's like. And it wasn't a performance-based God because the son did not do well. He did not do well at all. It wasn't a judgmental God waiting, you know, waiting for the son to come, come back so that he could hit him and, you know, and, and, and judge him and condemn him. It wasn't an uncaring God because he's talking about a, a dad who, who, who saw his son from a long way off. That means he was... Every day, the father would go to that spot on the balcony and look in the direction where his son had went off, where he was expecting and hoping and believing that his son would come back. And when he saw just the silhouette of his son coming from that distance, he runs towards that son. He's not an uncaring God. He wasn't critical. You know, the son was ready to, con- to say, you know, I've done this wrong, my sins, my this, my that. And that. Father, this, this God didn't count his sins or his faults against him didn't measure his his worthiness or his unworthiness wasn't going to allow i mean this guy has been with pigs wasn't going to allow religion and unworthiness keep him from embracing and pouring out his love and restoring his son this was offensive to the religious people of that time firstly the fact that you think you can call god your father the people are saying, how can you call God Father? And the fact that, that you, know, you are a sinner and you think that God still loves you and wants to restore you regardless. And the idea that God loves sinners, I mean, wh- where, where did you get that from? That's wrong. So Jesus comes to reveal the heart of the Father again. You know, and when the disciples ask Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says this, this is how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven. You know, we know the, the we've, we've turned that into a nice religious formal prayer. But when Jesus was saying our Father, he wasn't talking about, um, it wasn't like a formal term, our Father. He, the term that he was translated from the Aramaic means, he, he said Abba Father. So Abba is like, it's like a term of endearment. It's like coming to your dad. Dad, that's our father. Appa, Appa. It's like, it's a term of endearment. And he says, how to pray, that's how you go before this God. The first thing he says, dad, my dad. That's how it sounds like, my daddy. My daddy. It's because the moment you, the first thing he needed to address was the God that we were praying to, our perception of the God that we were praying to. 
The moment you step into His presence, you need to know you're going before a presence of a loving, loving Father. And that changes your, your sense of expectation, that changes how you pray, that changes how you communicate, that changes how you receive if you know that this is your daddy that you're going before. And it's a good daddy, loving daddy. Uh, Romans 8.15, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. All of us. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and, and joint heirs with Christ. And that's why I'm going to take another about 10 minutes. So, Payne, you can just play for 10 minutes and that's why the enemy has worked over time to kind of break or give or contaminate that image of the father. And you know, we need to pray for fathers. Dads need a lot of prayer. They come, they come under a lot of stress, a lot of attacks. Because the enemy knows if I can, if I can, I can contaminate this, this person, this father, I will contaminate the children's view of what a father is and ultimately I will contaminate the children's view, a generation's view of God, the father. So I work hard to contaminate that view of the father. And that's why today on this planet, one of the greatest problems we have are absentee fathers, abusive fathers, distant fathers, and because of that, people cannot grasp or understand the concept of what a loving father is. And, you know, and sometimes our concept of God is influenced by our own experiences. You know, I never understood what, what a father's heart meant or a father's love meant because I grew up with a dad who, who was an absentee father. He was also, he struggled with alcoholism and he was very abusive uh, growing up. And he's a guy who kept... Who, who just found it very difficult to keep his word. Now, you know, hardly ever kept his word. You know, I had a great mom, did a great job keeping us in line. wasn't easy, that's for sure. But, um, you know, and in my teens, in my late teens, he left us. And we never saw him again until he, he went to be a lot. But that's all water under the bridge now because we prayed for him during that period. We got saved, you know, I got saved, I came to know God. You know, we, we prayed for him and I went to, when I went to retrieve his body, I, you know, I always prayed for his salvation. I said, no, God, you know, that someone will meet him wherever he is and, you know, and witness to him that he will come to know you. And, um, and when I heard he, he, he died, I was a little sad. I was hoping that, you know, he would come to, he would have in some way come to know God. But when we went to claim his body, in his wallet, there's nothing much in his wallet but a prayer, a copy of the sinner's prayer that was in his wallet there. God allowed it to be there so that I would know that God had worked in his life. So he's gone to be with the Lord. But my own experience with my father had affected my view of God the Father. So when, when I came to know God and people said, hey, uh, you know, God is your loving father. I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a good father, he's a loving father. But I did not have a reference of what a loving father was. So I never, I was always expecting to be disappointed by God. I was always expecting to be let down. Always expecting... God to not show up for me. And, and God is good because He brought me on this journey of discovery. And on this journey, He introduced me to the Father's heart again that I may understand. And, and all this came to that point when I had my own kids. When I had my first son and, and as I was my own experience with my son and in that experience, I felt God speak to me. Now you know. See how you love your son, how you feel about your child. Now you know how I feel about you. If you, being an earthly dad with all your imperfections, with all your weakness, know how to love your child this much and how to be a good dad, how much more your heavenly father loves you? How much more I love you? In that relationship, I understood the heart of the father. You know, uh, uh, I remember carrying Ethan when he was young, right? Uh, he's a baby and, uh, and he vomits on my shoulders. You know, uh, how many of you have experienced that? Not Ethan vomiting on your shoulders, but uh, <laughs> your kids. Vomits on your shoulder. 
You know, and then when you're cleaning his diapers, you know, baby poop is not like a contained kind of a thing <laughs> in nice little, you know, blocks that you can... It's like just like there, all over the place, right? <laughs> and you cannot clean a diaper without getting some of it on your hands. You know, it makes a mess. You know, under normal circumstances, I would freak out. But in this circumstance, I don't, it didn't bother me at all. I didn't freak out. I just carried him. I'm like, you know, put him down, clean the mess. Or if it's a diaper, change the diaper, wash my hands so that he can be clean again. That's the heart of the Father. And you know what your Heavenly Father says about you? You know, there are times we mess up. We mess up. As children of God, we mess up. There are times we make a mess with our lives. We do things that are so disgusting that even we are disgusted thinking about those things that, that, that we do. We make mistakes. But there's a God, a Father, who's not dis- who's, who doesn't freak out. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you are willing. Don't let the mess you make keep you away from the Father. Because He is the only one who can clean that mess for you. And He's not freaked out. He's not disgusted. He's not saying, go and take a bath, come clean yourself, and then come and see me. He says, come to me. If you are willing, though your sins are red like crimson, scarlet, they will be as white as snow. If you are willing, come to the Father. You know, as, as a dad, I'm always looking out for my sons what they're doing, whether they're safe, whether they're endangering, endangering themselves, you know, climbing into fridge, trying to get sweets and, you know, playing with plug points, trying to charge the phone and, you know, my phone. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm constantly looking out, you know, so you can just go and pull them away, pull them away from the mess. The moment you think they're going towards something dangerous, you go and pull them away. Because as a dad, you don't want your kids harming themselves. Psalm 121 says this, The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. You know, some, God is watching over your life. And sometimes we go to things that are, that are not going to be um, good for us. And sometimes He pulls us away from things like that. Because he knows if you go continue in that life, sometimes he takes you away. Sometimes there are relationships that he takes you away from. Sometimes there are certain associations. Sometimes there are things that God just wants to take you away from. And you know, when I take things away from my kids, like if my son wants to play with a knife, you see, to him at that point, that knife is the best possible toy ever. But when I go take it away from him, he doesn't understand. He cries, he makes a fuss. But as a, as, as a father, I know if he carries on in this direction, he's going to end up hurting himself or killing someone in the house. <laughs> so I take it away from him. You know, sometimes God takes things away from you. Don't be angry with your father. He knows what he's doing. He knows if you continue in that direction, what's going to happen to you five years down the road, ten years. He sees your whole life. He knows. And sometimes he takes things away from you. Why? Because he loves you. He wants to keep you from all harm. You know, as a dad, my, my ears are always open to my kids. The moment you hear them crying, you run. What's happened? What's going on? Psalms 34 verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open unto their cry. That's your father. Your father's ears are open to their cry, to your cry. Don't think when you go before him, when you cry, when you're in pain, he doesn't know. You're on your own. You're alone. He knows everything that you are going to right now. His ears are open. Your every prayer, your every word reaches the heart of the father. You know, and nothing can stop me from loving my, my, my kids. You know, no matter how they mess up, they will always be my kids. Nothing can take that away. No matter what they do, they disown me one day, so I will not disown them. They will never stop being my kids. Romans 8.38 says this, 
and I am convinced, everybody say, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Not death, no life, no angels, no demons, no fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. Nothing. I mean, that's just like a big nothing, you know, right? He's like, he's stressing out, you know, earth, demons, whatever you can think of, your worries, your faithlessness, worries about tomorrow, talks about your lack of faith, you know, and everything, nothing you can think of, you think is disqualifying you, nothing can separate you from God's love, amen? amen. You know, and as a dad, I would give my life to ensure that my kids have a great future have a great tomorrow, that they don't mess up their lives in, the, in, in their future. And the Bible says this about your dad. He says, for God so loved you that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. Amen? Amen. You know, whatever I feel, you know, today is, is, is for fathers, right? So whatever I feel for my son, but you know, I need to mention that moms, you know, multiply the intensity of the love and you know, what I feel for my, for my son as a dad, or my sons, I keep forgetting sons, multiply the intensity of that love and you'll have, you'll understand a mother's love. Because whatever we feel, they feel a lot more. They carried the child, you know, they went through all that. You know, and, and God, God has a scripture for that as well. He says in Isaiah 49 verse 14, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? He says, can a mother do that? It's, it's really hard, right? But he goes on to say, Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. God is saying, you know, even if a mother can feel so much love, even if she forgets, I will not forget, forget you. I've engraved your name. I've engraved you in the... God's got a tattoo with your name on it on His hands. How's that? <laughs> Praise God. So today you are sons and daughters with a loving Father. Amen? And He wants, to, wants you to know the Father's heart. Amen? I'm going to end here. I want to ask you all to stand. John 1, verse 10, said he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, how many of, how many of you have received him here? Can I see your hand? It says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of men, but of God. Today we are all born of God into this great, great big family of God. You are all children of God. When you pray, remember, when you go, Jesus said, when you go before Him, you're going before your Abba Father, your dad. And He's a good dad. He's a loving dad. He loves you. Come before Him. And when you go before you, when my kids come before me, they know they can get something, you know, they, whatever they ask. But of course, that depends as well on, you know, if it's going to be bad or detrimental for them, I'm not going to give them. But that's the Father's heart. Me as a, we say we as earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to our children. Being evil ourselves, how much more your Heavenly Father will give you the promise of the Spirit. Amen? If you have never known God as your Heavenly Father, you know, He wants to reintroduce Himself to you today. Don't stay at the doorpost of salvation. Enter in into this great, great relationship. There is more. Everybody say, there is more. There is so much more for you. He wants to take you on an amazing, amazing journey with Him. Come on, let's lift our hands. I want you to lift your hands. Hallelujah. Father, we just...